Go ahead and ask Jeff, I think. Okay. <laughs> So now there's an interesting path uh, that, um, you know, in 09 I didn't have, uh, the official TA wasn't all that great, so I needed to, you know, get resources like other friends helping me. In 2010, I had an amazing TA, Jeremy Kong. So I actually know very little about the past because it's pretty much, you know, whatever you did. Well, first I want to like, give thanks to Andreas. I mean, let, let's be honest, like, let's acknowledge the history of the social data revolution. Like, it doesn't exist without this guy. Uh, the class doesn't exist without him. The concepts we're talking about don't exist without him. Us meeting together and being here tonight doesn't happen. So just want to start off by thanking you for putting all this together. Um, and it's really, like, it's actually a unique thing, right? We talk about data and, like, the primary value of data is, like, okay, we can make better decisions. So a lot of the time that results in people having analysis paralysis, thinking about decisions for a long time. This guy's a doer, right? Like, he goes out and it's like, oh, it's an idea. It happens the next day, right? He's sending emails when you're talking to him, so amazing, amazing. So quickly running through my history, I did a lot of social media, company, product management stuff. Um, it was a really interesting, rich domain for lots of data, uh, but something was a little bit off to me about how that data was being applied because essentially in the attention economy, you're, as a product manager, you're trying to get user attention and then selling that to advertisers. So I was like, okay, maybe I'll go to Stanford and got lucky and somehow tricked Andreas into spending time with me, uh, which was fantastic. And that gave me the leverage to go to Palantir, which is a really great company. Feel free to come up and chat with me afterwards. But, I only want to talk about uh, two things, um, and these are things that I learned through having the underground, the underpinnings of the social data revolution and the thoughts that we developed throughout the course, and merging that with how uh, Palantir, which is a really great big data company, is uh, advancing the field. So the first thing is uh, intelligence infrastructure. If you're trying to make better decisions, if you're trying to actually leverage data at your organization, whether you use Palantir or any sort of products that you cobble together, there's four core pillars that you need to build within your organization. And if you don't have systems to do it, you're doing it by email or you're doing it talking to colleagues. Like th these things happen whether you have infra infrastructure to support it or not. So the first is obviously data integration, right? If you don't have the fundamental underlying information, then uh, you won't be able to make good decisions. And you know, as we as we move along, you know, decision trees. As you get that, you know, you do a reasonable job of making good decisions given the information that you have. But a lot of times, the weakness in your model is that you don't have certain bits of information. You're not updating your priors quickly enough, or with the right information. So this is the core foundation that you need to have if you're going to make good decisions in your organization as a business or build any models. Um, this is what Ben was talking about in that models uh, atrophy quickly. Um, if you're not introducing the new information at the rate that you need to be introducing it, then your model will no longer apply and machine learning will fail you. Second, you can't just collect the information. You need to actually make good decisions based on it. So if you just have the data and you have like a data visualization company, it's like, okay, cute. You can do the raw housing thing of, on, uh, on a TED talk where it's really, really great, right? He, he gets really animated and shows like, here's all these great things that happened over the history of humanity and how they, how like different countries evolved, but there's no action item associated with it. It's really, really great. It's really powerful to see data in that context, but if you can't make a decision off of it, if you can't do something productive, it doesn't create any value. And this is what Enrique was saying uh, in that, you know, the design part of the problem comes, you have to ask the right questions. If you're not solving important questions, important problems with your data, then it doesn't matter, even if you're integrating and doing the coolest tool in the world. Okay, so these are the two fundamental core foundations. You have to have raw data, and you have to convert it into actionable insights. How do you get leverage out of that? Well, the third piece is that you need to actually have knowledge management somehow in your organization. And most of the time, that's your email inbox, right? It's like your old emails of someone who had a good insight or a good decision, and it's like, maybe you remember that from last year. Salesforce is really great for a lot of things. What it's terrible at is you can't look at your pipeline from like six months ago. So you might have changed your decisions based on some analysis that you did in Salesforce, but you don't update, you, you can't look back and say, did my actions that I took as a result of that information make any difference? And that's a really important part that you have to do when you're looking at data, because if you don't acknowledge that there is some delta between what that uh, decision made versus where you are prior to that, then again, as a data company, you can't advocate that you're creating any value. 
The last piece is you have to have collaboration. You can't do it alone. Like, no company is an island, no person's an island. You have to work with other people. If you have a model that applies to your team, and you can't apply that to another team where it's going to be highly leveraged, you need to figure out how you can bring your information and your investigations to that other team. So Palantir happens to be built on these four pillars. It's really great for you know, catching bad guys, fraudsters, things like that. But the underlying reason that these things are important is that irrespective of domain, you have to do these things if you're going to be making good decisions. And I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. Here's one example of a company that could build things that does a good job with this. The second thing that I wanted to impart upon you is the actual act of uh, making good decisions and how you can, that, that search and discovery piece. Um, so you might think that analysis, sort of your analytical power, is a function of humans and computers, right? So let's just multiply them together, it's a linear <laughs> function, and it's like, cool, that works out pretty well. Well, that's a pretty simple equation, um, but it turns out there's a, a really great, uh, there's a really great laboratory that you can experiment with data in, it's called Chess. Uh, there's lots of different moves that you can have in there. Um, Gary Kasparov happened to be pretty good at it, Deep Blue happened to be a little bit better at it than him, uh, and everyone thinks, okay, that's the end of the story. Well, it turns out in 2005, uh, a site called Play Chess, which was sponsored by uh, Gary Kasparov, hosted a chess tournament. And the chess tournament was, you can have any team that you want, you can have any computers that you want, all that matters is your move at the end of the day. So it's a no holds barred chess tournament. You know, it's like the fight club of chess tournaments. And so all of these different teams entered the tournament. So there's grand master teams with all the luminaries in the field. There's you know the predecessor to Watson over here with IBM. You know who are, who are doing it. You have all these different sorts of teams that enter the tournament. And at the end of the day, uh, it's a really counterintuitive team that wins. It's two U.S. amateurs with three commodity laptop computers that end up winning the tournament defeating all of these huge resources that were dedicated on the computer side. These massive luminaries of, uh, you know, the most forward-thinking chess, chess uh, visionaries in the world. And what they found is they analyzed, like, how, how did this work out? Like, how, how did this team win? And what they found is that uh, human minds happen to be really good at pattern recognition. We happen to be really good at looking at layered senses of information and being able to intuit where the right move may exist on the board. And oh, by the way, computers have to be really, really good at serialized, at, uh, at um, linear sort of multi-computational things and being able to drill down into one area of the board and optimize on brute force algorithm, like what's the best move going to be within this area of the world. So that team was able to optimize the human-computer interaction between doing what humans do best and doing what computers do best. So you know, here's an example of one algorithm that may be you know, our updated model of what analysis might look like, which is that if you add in a friction coefficient, which is to say that the best thing that we can do to increase our analytical, analytical horsepower as a human race, at this point in time, this may not be true 20 years from now as machine learning gets way better, uh, for the next 10 years, is to reduce human-computer interaction, or reduce the friction between human-computer interaction, <coughs> such that human analysts anyone that's doing intelligence work can have maximal leverage from what computers are able to um, give to them based on all the data integration we just talked about, integrating that and presenting it, whether it's visualization or tables or prioritization. But this, this coefficient is what's going to result in the most gains in analytical horsepower for the human race in the next five to 10 years. Um, so those are those two points that I thought might be interesting that I kind of grew out of working with the social data revolution, and thanks for listening. And thanks for speaking, actually, in this true computer direction. I remember when you got me to use a Lighthouse, which was called, it was like a project management. Oh, Lighthouse app? Yeah. So Don't try to use a product man project management tool with this guy. There's no way it would ever work. Ha! <laughs> the idea of a prioritized list, no, it's right now. It's right now. <laughs> One of the best things.